All right, we're going to go ahead and get started, inshallah. We did five minutes. <laughs> okay, sure. so last week we did this hadith about Deliberation. So I'm just going to go over, do a quick review, and then we'll go on to our hadith for today, inshallah. So the Prophet ﷺ said that careful deliberation is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and haste is from shaitan. And we kind of talked about, we went into detail about how, in general, being hasty, being impulsive, being impatient is a quality that shaitan likes to incite people towards. And in general, being very slow and careful and deliberate in making decisions is from Allah. And it's a sunnah of the Prophet, ﷺ, and it's a quality of the believers. But there are certain cases in which being hasty is actually a good thing, right? And one of those things is asking forgiveness. Allah says in the Quran, race towards forgiveness from your Lord. It is the only action in which haste is praiseworthy in terms of uh, ibadah and good deeds. So when it comes to um, making the salah, for example, you hear the adhan, you should quickly run and try to do um, the good deed as soon as possible, right? But when it comes to something else, you should actually hold back and be like, wait a second, is this a good decision? Is this the right decision or not? Um, forgiveness and salah. So, and then bad hastiness. What is bad hastiness? It's like when you're trying to make a decision, like, oh, which college should I go to? Or which job should I get? Or who should I marry? Things like that, those should not be done in a hurry. Those are the things that require time. You ask people, you do istikhara, uh, you consult with others, and then you make those decisions. Um, judging between people. So let's say somebody comes to you and they're like, oh, you know, I, there's a problem between this person and that person. And you're like, oh, I know she's wrong. I know he's wrong. He always does this, right? So we, jump in, we're, we jump to these conclusions and that is a bad type of haste. That's, that's not the one that Allah likes. And then the third thing is uh, shopping, for example. It's a small example. Something's on sale. You don't even think about it. Can I afford it? Can I not? You just like jump in and you try to buy that thing without really thinking about the consequences. So there's, there's times when you should be hasty and then there's times when you should not be hasty. 
Now we're going to go into our actual hadith for today, which is al-majalisu bil amana, which is which basically means gatherings are to be kept in confidence, i.e., confidential. Confidential is it's supposed to be kept not secret but personal, and you don't go around spreading news to other people when you're doing something when you're when you're listening to people in a gathering. Okay, the Prophet ﷺ said that he who believes in Allah in the last day, he should speak what is good or keep silent. So there's a lot of different hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ says this. He says that whoever believes in Allah in the last day, and then he mentions some qualities. This is a phrase that he uses very often in the hadith. One of the reasons why he does that, it's like he's giving a description of the believers. That whoever is a believer should do X, Y, Z. Right? It's like, you know when presidents give speeches sometimes, and they're like, oh, the good American is the one who does X, Y, Z. Right? The true American is the one who, you know, whether they're for gun laws or against gun laws, they'll be like, the true American is the one who... So then the person who's listening is like, oh, I'm the true American, or I'm the, I'm the true whatever, whoever's listening. So when the Prophet is speaking, he's speaking to the Sahaba, and they're sitting there, and he's saying that whoever believes in Allah in the last day should X, Y, Z. So now you as a believer are like, wait, I believe in Allah, I believe in the last day, what is the Prophet ﷺ telling me, right? So he says he should speak good, speak what is good or keep silent. So if you don't have anything good to add to a conversation, you shouldn't add anything, just stay quiet, right? Amana is a trust. So the word amana in Arabic is a trust. The Prophet ﷺ, before he accepted Islam was known as al-amin. Al-amin means the most trustworthy. When somebody told him something and said it's a secret, it would stay there, it wouldn't go anywhere else. When somebody came to him and they said, hey, can you take care of this for me? I'm traveling, whatever. He'd be like, sure. And he would take care of the thing as if it was his own. So the people came to know him as Al-Amin, the most trustworthy. So Amana is a trust, meaning whatever is shared in a gathering, you are required to keep it to yourself. This is something that women actually find it very hard to do because we love to talk, we love to gossip, uh, which we shouldn't, but unfortunately it's part of us. So we have to keep removing that part from us. So there's an unsaid understanding. The Prophet is teaching us these social rules, these social etiquettes, that sometimes somebody shares something good, right? Let's say you're sitting amongst your friends, somebody shares good news. Are you allowed to go share that somewhere else now? What do you think? Good news? No. Why? Because you're really excited. You're like, oh, okay, I'm going to share this good news somewhere else because I'm doing something good. I'm sharing this person's, you know, whatever college they got into or somebody got married. I'm just sharing good news. What if they didn't want other people to know, right? Sometimes we think that, oh, I'm not sharing something bad. I'm just sharing something good. But what if they didn't want somebody to know? So our rule should be that, okay, when somebody shares good news in this gathering, this specific gathering, I'm not going to take it outside of the room. Or when somebody shares bad news, maybe somebody's grandmother has cancer, maybe someone's family member died, right? Maybe somebody is traveling for not a good reason, right? Some, they have to go somewhere. You, don't, you can't share that somewhere else. So you have to be very careful in the information that you share. The occasions when this does not apply. There are certain times when you are in a gathering and there's information that is shared and even if somebody says, this is a secret, don't share it, you have to share it. Why? Because it could be, it could be dangerous, right? So for example, if somebody's plotting a crime, someone tells you, hey, I'm planning on hurting myself. I'm planning on hurting somebody else. That's information you're required to share, right? You have to go tell somebody that this is what's happening. If, whether you're a kid, you're an adult, whoever you are, you go tell the authorities, this is what I heard, something bad is planning to happen, and I want to stop it. Um, if we can prevent harm or danger. Again, small harm, big harm, whatever, it doesn't matter. You have to go tell somebody. Um, warning someone of a person's known evil. Okay, so in Islam, we have this concept of uh, making excuses for the believer. We have this concept of uh, covering people's faults, right? But what if somebody has a bad quality that is going to hurt other people, right? So in certain cases, when somebody comes to you and asks you about their character, you're supposed to generally tell them good things, right? We don't, we don't backbite about other Muslims. But in some cases, it's halal to backbite, okay? What is that? For example, somebody wants to marry someone, right? That's a very common example. 
somebody wants to marry someone and they're like, hey, tell me about this guy. Is this, is this, a, good, is this a good Muslim? I see he goes to the masjid, he does this, that. But somebody's like, no, actually, he also has these bad qualities, these bad friends, where he goes to certain places regularly, not just once. Regularly, he goes to these certain places where he shouldn't be. Right? So you're, you're actually required to tell that person because you can't let them be in deception. Okay? So when it comes to important matters like that, you have to tell the person. Or, let, like him. or let's say somebody's about to get hired, right? And they ask you about this per like, you know, recommendations, recommendation letters. So let's say you're about to hire somebody. And now you know, as the recommender, the job is calling you, they're like, hey, we're asking you about this person. What can you tell us about them? And you're like, hmm, either I can, because I know this person for so long, either I can just lie and say something good to help them get the job, or I have to be honest, right? So as a Muslim, you have to be honest. So you're like, okay, this person is not very good with dealing with money, meaning they're, they're not trustworthy with money, or they're not very, um, they're not very punctual in their time. They're not gonna show up to time on work, at work, right? Because you know that maybe as a student, they were never on time. So at work, they're probably gonna do the same thing, right? And you didn't see them change. So you have to know, you have to tell them honestly what you know about the person, right? So there's certain cases in which you're allowed to backbite. And I'm just using the word, I'm using quotation marks because it's not really backbiting. You're actually telling them information that is necessary, okay? But other than that, other than those situations, where did it disappear? Yeah. Other than those situations, um, you have to actually keep the gathering confidential. Like for example, giving an example, right now we're all live streaming this, but if we were not, right? Let's say we had a discussion in here and then somebody shared something personal. Right? We do that sometimes with our teachers, with our classmates, with in, in gatherings like this. Sometimes somebody's like, oh, that, I really relate to that because you know, X, Y, Z happened in my life and this, is what, this hadith reminds me of that or this ayah reminds me. And then I take it and I tell somebody else. We're not allowed to do that because this amana, this gathering is a trust. Right? This, it, you, can't, you can't take it. Even if the person didn't say this is a secret, even then, you count it as a secret. That's what the Prophet is trying to say. So the default is you do not share at all. Unless the person explicitly tells you, I want you to share. Okay? All right. This is a kind of a, a point that kind of goes beyond the hadith a little bit. So if you find people in your life who are not respecting you sometimes, then look where you are sinning. And this is related to this idea of fulfilling people's rights in Islam. Other people's rights, other people's honor, and the, the things they tell you about themselves, the, thing you, the things you happen to know about them, they're supposed to be covered for the most part, right? We don't go around advertising people's business. Of course, like we said in the job or the marriage example, we have to tell them the truth if we're asked, but we don't generally, like as soon as you find out something about somebody, oh, do you know what this person did? Do you know what she did? Do you know what he did? Some people, they, they get a lot of happiness from doing that. They're like, oh, I found out something bad about someone. The Prophet ﷺ is negating this whole attitude. He's saying that if you, if you take somebody's information, some per, somebody's personal information, and you spread it, you're essentially taking away their right, right? Because the Muslims have rights upon each other. And one of them is to cover the faults of your Muslim brother or sister. So if you find in your life that somebody's not giving you your rights, somebody's mistreating you, somebody is not respecting you. Somebody has spread information about you. The first thing you should do is look to yourself and be like, did I do that with someone? Did I take away someone's right? And it doesn't have to be the same person, right? Um, sometimes people will say like, oh, my daughter's not listening to me. Like a mom, a mom will say, my daughter is not listening to me. She should reflect on, did I listen to my parents at this age? Or if I, if I didn't, did I repent from that, right? Did I ask Allah for forgiveness? And did I repent from that? And did I, did I rectify myself? Did I rectify myself to the point where now that, that I became an obedient daughter to my mother, for example, or a respectful daughter to my mother? So the, 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 the Salaf, the scholars of the past, they would say that when I disobey Allah, I see it in the attitude of my wife. Like a, like a man is saying this. He would say that sometimes I commit a sin in private that my wife doesn't even know about. But Allah finds a way to make her do something to me that makes me remember 
that I disobeyed Allah. So people, people's hearts, they incline towards us, they incline away from us, depending on our relationship with Allah. Right? So there's another scholar, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to quote him, I don't want to misquote him actually, but he said that um, when, we, when we sin, Allah either causes people's hearts to, to, to move towards us or to, or to move away from us. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't worry about what people think. Because what people think is dependent only upon Allah. So when, we, when you try to make people like you, Allah can make them dislike you. And when you try to make people dislike you, Allah can make them like you. So it's not in your hands, right? People's hearts are not in our hands. We can't control their mind. We can't control their heart. But Allah can. Right? And then he also, along with the wife, he also said his riding animals, like when they would ride donkeys or horses or camels, he would say that even the animal would become disobedient to him. Right? It's not comparing animals to women, by the way. It's just an example where he's saying that I would disobey Allah and Allah would cause my animal to disobey me. So it's like this kind of like the cycle, right? Um, and, and the purpose of that is not to punish you, right? A lot of people think, well, if I have a disobedient child, does that mean Allah's punishing me? Not necessarily, right? Because how do we know in Islam if something is a test or a punishment? We know by our response. Right? If Allah gives us a hardship, if Allah gives us family problems, Allah gives us money problems, how do we know if that's a test or a hardship? Is it taking us towards Allah? Is it taking us away from Allah? Right? If we increase in our sabr, if we increase in our yaqeen, our certainty, if we start to make more dua, we start to pray more tahajjud, then that hardship was actually a gift because it brought us closer to Allah. But if we start to become hard, our heart becomes hard and we become just distance from Allah, like, oh, I don't, you know, Allah gave me a hardship, maybe he doesn't love me, and whatever the whispers shaitan is giving you, you kind of fall into those whispers, and you're like, you try to isolate yourself away from the masjid, from Allah, that, that means it was a punishment, right, when you don't act with sabr, so sabr is the bare minimum, we kind of covered this before, where sabr is the bare minimum response that you're, that you're meant to have, so if, the, if you have that sabr, and you have the, the contentment with Allah, then it brought you closer, right, Okay, so mis misinformation and, and, and gatherings again. So back in the day, spreading misinformation was hard. Why? Because there was no technology. There was no internet. A lot of people didn't even know what people looked like. Right? People didn't even know what, like, they knew like, oh, there's a sheikh who lives in Medina, for example. I'm going to go study hadith from him. They had no idea what the sheikh even looked like. Right? So people would know of these great imams. People would know of each other that, oh, this king exists or this politician exists or whatever. But they wouldn't just have a photograph available the way we do now. Right? When you open the internet, you can find celebrity gossip without even looking for it. Right? You go on Google and Google will tell you everything. All the news is just going to be right there. So you don't need to go looking for gossip. It's going to come to your face. Right? So because it's so easy to spread, sometimes we'll find the gossip. And it, what we'll do? Copy and paste. Send it to somebody else. Oh, do you know what this happened to this celebrity? Do you know what happened to this person? But celebrities are still people, right? So we shouldn't actually be talking about them like that because they're still human. So now that everything is easier, it's easier to, to spread the gossip. It's easier to backbite. Right? When you're on the phone and you're talking about things, it's easy to slip into, oh, this happened with this person and that happened with that person. And it's, and it's backbiting, right? Because we're saying something the person doesn't want us to say. So that's why this hadith is more relevant for us. Because when, when, when misinformation can spread faster, you can fall into sin faster. So if you fall into sin faster, you have to be more careful, right? That's why we have to be more careful. Like, what WhatsApp conversations are we having? That's a gathering, right? So sometimes, you know what happens? Like, there's four, let's say there's like six friends. They're part of a WhatsApp group. And then like, a few months later, two of them find out that there's a separate WhatsApp group with only four. Sometimes that happens. It's actually way too common, right? So there's a six-member WhatsApp group, and then there's another more private one that has only four people, and two of them are left out. Now, the things that were shared in that six-people WhatsApp group should not be shared in the four-people group because for whatever reason they were left out. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Right? Maybe they were right to leave out the two, or maybe they were wrong to leave out the two. That's not the issue. The issue is that it was, it was, it was a separate gathering. Right? I'm using the word gathering because we think gathering is just us being in person. But gathering can be online as well now. 
right? So somebody shares something and then it causes fitna because like, oh, why wasn't I told about this event happening over there? Why wasn't I invited to her birthday party and her, you know, baby shower? It causes fights and friction between, between people, right? When they might have a good reason sometimes to have those different groups. So that also counts as, as a majalis, as a gathering, right? But majlis. Okay. Uh, when asking for advice, so this is kind of uh, when you are asking advice on behalf of somebody else. So somebody comes to you like, and, and they're like, okay, you go to the masjid a lot. Um, you see the imam more often than me. Can you ask him about a personal matter of mine? And you're like, okay. So let's say she tells you this whole story and she adds all these details that maybe he doesn't need to know, right? Maybe it's like very, very private. You can, you can leave those out unless she gives you ex explicit permission, right? Or maybe she wants advice on just one certain matter and now you're sitting there telling the whole story with all the extra details, right? So you shouldn't actually do that. You should only tell just the important stuff that is necessary to get that advice, right? So you shouldn't add your own like extra stuff. So you have to be very careful what you tell somebody else uh, while getting advice because you might be like, okay, well, I'm getting advice. I'm doing something good. You know, I'm helping somebody out. But you have to be very careful what you say and how you say it. Sometimes the way we say something can make the other person look bad, right? The way we talk about ourselves, like imagine we fall into a sin, right? And now we're getting advice. Oh, Imam, like, you know, I, fall in, I, like, I committed this sin. I feel so bad. Like, I always keep trying to, you know, I keep doing tawbah, but I keep going back to it. The way we talk about ourselves is with a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding. We try to frame it in a way like, oh, we're like, oh, poor me. Like, I'm falling into this, you know? But when we talk about somebody else, we're like, yeah, that person, they're an open sinner. They just, do, they just keep doing this. That person doesn't even pray. So we have to be very careful how we present the matter, how we talk about somebody else, because we're painting an image of them that might not be accurate, right? So it's, it, we have to be very careful with other people's reputations and how we present their story because it matters. It changes the other person's opinion of them, okay? Um, how is this not working? All right. Okay, so hadith number six is al haya shu'batun min al-iman. So in a longer hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that iman has 70-something branches. Like iman is like a tree, and it has 70 different branches. And one of those branches is haya. This word is very misunderstood. Um, so we're going to kind of talk about and uh, dive a little bit deep. But before that, I want to ask you guys what you think haya is in your words. Or how have you heard it translated? Shyness. Okay, shyness is one, yes. What do you, what is hayat? And, and from whatever you've learned in the past, or whatever definition comes to mind for you. It's not only shyness, it's kind of like, um, it's a kind of mind. It's like that you are not, you, you, not only the shyness, mm -hmm. it's so shy and, you know, like quiet and shy. But also hayat is another mean that you entertain it, you are, you're self-conscious for things that you don't want to do with, you keep yourself, your, your dignity, your, I mean, Mm -hmm. Dignity, yeah. That, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. you protect it, like, you know, yourself from, from things that happen around you and in other shapes of shyness, I guess. Protecting yourself from things that are, like, bad, you said? Yeah, like, the, okay. you know, like your, you know, protecting your reputation. Okay. Like, okay. So it's privacy, maybe? Like, privacy and shyness? Okay, I like that addition. Yeah, we can explore that. What were you saying? Um, I think you were saying something? No? Okay. Anybody else want to add something to that? Yes. <laughs> Even when you talk, mm -hmm. you have to have manners. Man like manners? manners? Okay. So good manners? <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go through the different uh, meanings of the different derivatives of the word hayat, right? So the, the letters are uh, ha, I think, ya, I, ha and ya, I think, yeah. So hayat, the word hayat itself means life itself. Hayya means to live, to see, to experience, and to witness. Istihya means to keep alive. I, I couldn't find the Arabic, so I just, I lost my Arabic keyboard, so I put it in English. Um, and then hayat, the word, the word we're talking about, hayat, it's translated as shame or bashfulness, which is shyness or timidity. 
I don't agree with all of those definitions, but again, as Muslims, sometimes we get stuck on this, just this last part, right? We get stuck on the, the shyness and, and being timid, right? But I don't, I don't think it really has to do with being timid. I put those there because the dictionary had them. The Arabic dictionary had these definitions, but I, th I thought it's worth talking about, so I put them there. Let's talk about hayya, right? The word hayya, the second one. To live to see and experience and witness. It's part of being alive. If you never see the world or experience it, you're not actually alive, right? Like physically. Imagine somebody who lives in a box their whole life and they never go outside. They're not really living. They're not really experiencing. They don't, they're like, they're just, they haven't really, um, yeah, experienced, I guess is the word for that. Um, istihya, to keep something alive, right? In order to keep our body alive, we eat food. In order to keep our ruh alive, we feed it salah and Quran, the worship of Allah. So without the worship of Allah, without the remembrance of Allah, our ruh and our heart will die. So in essence, it's not going to have haya anymore. Okay? Um, shame. A lot, now we, we, we have this like, discussion of is shame good or is shame bad, right? Like in psychology, in Western psychology at least, they, start, they say that shame is something bad. And so, so to counter that, we have, in Islam we have this idea that there is good shame and there is bad shame. Because from a psychological, yes, go ahead. Good shame, good shame. Good shame, yeah. So let me explain the bad shame first and then I'll go to the good shame. So bad shame is like if I do something wrong, I'll be like, I'm a horrible human being. I'm like, uh, like Allah hates me. I'm, I'm horrible. I can never change. Um, this is just the way I am. And so you start to hate yourself and you fall deeper and deeper into the self-hate and blame. And a lot of Muslims fall into this, especially the ones who keep falling into the same sin. Like let's say somebody has an addiction problem. It's very easy for them to fall into shame because they think, well, Allah's never going to forgive me. And shaitan, obviously he... He keeps whispering to them. So that's the bad kind of shame, where you make it about who you are. When in reality, your sins don't make you a bad person if you're repenting. But then the good shame is like the, the, um, the hayat that we're, I'm going to go into detail more again. But it's like the Prophet when he said that whoever has no hayat, let them do as he wishes. Right? So like he's saying that the person who openly commits evil, they openly commit sins in public, and they feel no guilt, no remorse, and they, they advertise their sins to other people. Um, so that's like, so he's saying that if you have no shame, he used the word, sh like, he used the word haya in the meaning of shame. If you have no shame, then do, what you, do whatever you want. So in that sense, we should have a good, good sense of shame, which is like, oh, I feel bad about committing sins, where you want to hide your sins. So it's like a natural human shame that we have. We could describe it like when Adam السلام, and Hawa were in Jannah and they, when they ate from the tree and then all of a sudden they realized that, oh, we're not wearing any clothes. So they covered themselves because there was a, there was a physical connection with the spiritual, the, the spiritual guilt that they felt. There was, a, there was a physical connection there. So all of a sudden they became aware that they had to cover themselves. Right? And whenever we sin, Allah says that I covered you. Like on the Day of Judgment when we go, Allah says when you, when I, when you sinned, I covered you in the dunya, and today I'm going to cover you. Unless you went and advertised it yourself. Those are the people that Allah does not cover on the Day of Judgment. But the ones who covered their own sins, and they had that healthy sense of shame, like in front of Allah, right? The healthy shame in front of Allah. Then Allah will cover you on the Day of Judgment. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. 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 We have to have accountability. Yes. That's the um, muhasaba. We have to have muhasaba. Yeah. The good one. Yeah. But it's like the good shame is the one that brings about muhasaba. That's what I'm talking about. It's like that feeling of, like it's kind of like. Especially the type of sin that you do, it's a kind of a, a disappointment in yourself, right? Like, I, I wish I didn't do this. That type of shame, we consider it good in Islam because it leads you to tawbah, right? So the Prophet said, if you have no shame, then do whatever you want. 
He's saying that if you don't have that feeling, like, Ya Allah, like, I'm sorry, I can't believe I did this, that person's never going to repent, right? They're never going to do tawbah. So that's what he's saying. Um, timidity, again, timid means to be like quiet and, and, and shy, like a, like, you know, those girls who are like, they're very, they're taught to be just don't talk in front of men or don't laugh too loud. I don't really like that meaning because it doesn't really apply. It seems like it does. This is a hayat that we try to teach girls all the time, but it doesn't actually apply as much because there were sahabiyat that we know who were very loud. <laughs> they were very active. They had personalities that were, let's say, um, we would consider like, I guess a little bit more out there, right? But it didn't contradict their hayat. Like their, their modesty, their religiosity was still there. They didn't, they didn't contradict um, any of the laws of Allah. They didn't disobey Allah. But they had different types of personalities. So to say that all Muslim women must be the same, that's actually kind of damaging because they don't have to be. Like not everybody has to be quiet and like hide who they are and erase their personality. Islam doesn't tell you to do that, right? So I don't like, that's why I don't like the word timid, but um, haya is more than that. So according to my sheikh, uh, Sheikh Mukhtar, he describes haya as this. He says it's a spiritual sensitivity um, and discomfort with that which is wrong. So when you come across something that is haram, when you see it, when you hear about it, it bothers you in your heart. And this is the definition uh, like, uh, that I really, really love because the way he described it is like, it's most closely related to iman, right? We just said that uh, haya is a, is, a, is a branch of iman, right? So what is the relationship between iman and haya then? If we only said it was shyness, right? then it's, it's kind of hard to make that connection between shyness and iman. But if we call it sensitivity, right, like the spiritual sensitivity, you feel uncomfortable with something haram. Why do you feel uncomfortable with the haram? It's because the light of iman is in your heart. Right? Iman is a light from Allah. I'm combining things with different ahadith where the Prophet said that like, iman is a light, right? Um, and then in Surah, Surah Al-Hujurat, um, Allah describes that the believers are the ones who um, Allah beautified Iman for them. Right? And then He made Iman uh, beloved to them. He made them love Iman. The believers are the ones who Allah made them love Iman. And وَقَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَفُسُقُوا عَلِيْسِيَانِ Yeah, He made them hate disbelief and He made them hate disobedience to Allah. And He made them hate transgressions. So, as a believer, you know your heart is alive. Right? Again, life and hayat. Your heart is alive, it has haya when you love what Allah loves and you're drawn towards it. You feel it in your heart. Like when the Quran is being recited, when somebody tells you to go to the masjid, you want to go, you're drawn towards that. When somebody calls you to something haram, your nafs might find it enticing, right? Because the nafs is separate. The nafs wants to do things that seem fun or whatever. So you might think for a moment, because yeah, you're still human, right? You might think for a moment, yeah, that sounds like fun. But then the iman in your heart is going to be like, no, that's it's repulsive to me, right? And the more, the higher the iman you have, the higher the hayat you have. So your sensitivity increases. Your sensitivity to sin increases. And that's a good sensitivity to have because without it, you won't be able to tell the difference anymore, right? Um, so like if people are calling you to bad company, bad places, let's say somebody's not practicing, right? And they used to go, like Muslim, but they were not practicing ever. They never grew up like that. They would go to the club, they would go to the whatever, you know, all these things. And then they started becoming more practicing. So they go to the bar with their non-Muslim friends, whoever. And maybe before they used to drink alcohol, right? And now they're like, you know what? I don't want to drink it. They're still there. Like, we're talking about stages now. They're, they still went to the bar because they're not completely changed yet. But now when the alcohol arrives at the table, they're like, I don't want it anymore. And then the next stage, they're like, their friends are like, hey, let's go hang out at the bar. They're like, I don't want to go there anymore. Why? Because the sensitivity changed. Right? Their iman grew. As they became more practicing, they're coming closer to Allah now, and they're doing tawbah, their iman started to change, and their hayat increased. So the sensitivity became more. Before, I could sit at the same table with alcohol in front of me. Now I can't even sit at the same table anymore. That was the hayat that increased. Your discomfort level became so much that I don't even want to see that. I don't want to be near it. Even the smell bothers me now, right? 
And those of us who grew up practicing, we can relate, right? If you pass, if at the grocery store, you just pass by the wine aisle, and you're like, I don't even want to go in that aisle, right? Nothing's touching you. The bottles are closed. It's not, it's not going to get on you. But you're just like, I don't, you don't want to be near it. That's, that's kind of what Hayat is like, right? Or somebody says a bad word. Somebody says disgusting language. They're using bad language in the music, right? The music is really bad. They used derogatory terms towards women sometimes, right? Very derogatory terms. When you hear that, you're like, doesn't sit right with me anymore. Don't want to listen to that, right? So it, it changes, and you start to notice it when you, when you come across different things, maybe things you used to do. Now you changed, and you're like, I don't want to, I, I, I can't even be near that anymore. And we feel all of us actually have an experience with this in Ramadan, right? Maybe we listened to music before Ramadan, like bad music, whatever. Or maybe we did something, maybe we engaged in backbiting. And now in Ramadan, we cleansed ourselves, right? We fasted, so Allah cleansed our our body, we cleansed our heart, we cleansed our soul, we did so much tawbah, we did so much ibadah that the poison was pushed out of us. And now at the end of Ramadan, imagine on Eid, somebody tells you to do something haram. Your heart is going to be like, mm-mm, because your sensitivity level is like peak, right? You just became, you just made your heart so alive that even the tiniest bit of evil is like, no. You can, re you can resist it, you can say no to it easily because you trained yourself, right? Um, all right, and then a uh, branch of Iman. Okay, so your conviction, it determines how you, how you see things and then how you react to things. So that's kind of what we just covered. So when, when, when people invite you to something, you're able to more easily be like, no, you have the willpower to be like, no, I don't want to engage in that. It's no longer like a struggle for you the way it used to be before. Because your haya helps your iman, and your iman helps your haya. And they're both connected to each other, right? And then the Prophet said another hadith, he said, haya and iman are companions. If one of them leaves, the other will also leave. If one of them leaves, the other is also going to leave. Meaning, if your iman goes down, the haya is going to go down, right? And then if the, if the haya goes down, the iman is going to go down. They're connected to each other. They always have to be together. So if we understand um, haya as a spiritual sensitivity and discomfort, then how, how can we try to keep both of them alive? Our iman and our haya, how can we keep both of them alive? Remembering Allah every time. Yes, dhikr actually is a polish of the heart, right? Dhikr cleanses the heart. So let's say you committed some sins, now you feel the heaviness in your heart, and then you do dhikr and you ask, you do tawbah, and it erases, cleanses your heart. Now you're able to see more clearly, right? Anybody else? Yes, Tahayat. Yes, more ibadah, yes. especially Qur'an. Yeah. Qur'an is very cleansing because Allah calls the Qur'an a shifa, right? So um, not having haya is like a spiritual disease where somebody who, who's openly committing sins and they're bragging about their sins, they have a spiritual disease, right? In the heart, they have something is rotting. So when you, when you, uh, when you read Qur'an, it actually helps remove that from your heart. Yes, we saw? Um, being more around people that bring you closer to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. The company. The company you keep. Yes. Okay. Two types of hayat. There are two types of hayat. Number one is innate hayat, which is already within you. You're born with this. It's part of your fitrah. Um, nobody really has to teach you this, maybe a little bit, but mostly it's within yourself, right? For example, not wanting people to see our aura. right? Sometimes you can see this in babies, even like babies who are, you know, like toddlers or whatever. The ones who are getting their diaper changed, or they, you know, have to get a change. They, they go away from people, you know, unless they're being, you know, naughty in that, in that, that time. But mostly, they're like, oh, they try to go away from people. They even tell their moms, you know, they don't, if there's a whole group of people, they get shy. They, they sometimes don't want to change their clothes in front of other people. That natural, that, that's natural hayat. Like, you, you don't want to uncover yourself in front of random strangers. Kids have that. They have the understanding, right? And we also know this because in the Quran, Surah An-Nur, when Allah tells the women to cover, right, to cover their the aura, He says, "Start covering in front of the kids who have a discernment between the, the 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 body parts of the human being." 
So like up until a certain age, a mom can go to the shower and have her baby like right there, right? Because she has to take care of the baby. There's nobody else at home. But after a certain age, the kid understands, right? The kid can understand. So then Allah says, you have to cover. Even the mother, right? Because first, it's, if it's like a six-month-old or whatever, one-year-old, it's whatever, right? She can, she can do whatever she needs to do. But after a while, she has to start covering because a child can understand. So that's your innate hayat, like you know as a human being that you're supposed to cover, right? Um, not wanting people to know that we're doing something wrong, right? Even when kids lie, they don't want you to know they're lying, right? They'll try to cover it up. Right? Or they try to blame their little brother or sister for something that happened. Right? When they do something wrong, when they make a mistake, they don't want people to know. Right? So it's the natural human uh, fitrah to not advertise your sin. Right? Because we're all going to sin. Adam, like the Prophet said that um, all the sons of Adam are sinners. All, every single one of us is going to sin. But he said the best one of us are the ones who repent. So there, it's not a question of, am I going to sin? Am I not going to sin? No, I am going to. I'm going to do something wrong. I'm going to do it like I'm going to commit fahsha, right? Even fahsha, like the really bad, evil sins. We even commit those, but we want to hide them. We should want to hide them. We should want Allah to cover us. That's a natural hayat. But some people that, you know, the culture has become that you go and advertise. Right? You go and tell people on social media, tell your friends what you were up to last night, all that kind of stuff. It's, 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 that person has no hayat when they get to that level. Right? Um, a natural dislike, we all talked about this, a natural dislike for sin and immorality. So even, even non-Muslims, right? we all agree that killing is bad. Right? They don't have a concept of halal and haram, but we as human beings, we agree that lying is wrong, that stealing is wrong, that killing is wrong. We agree that... Um, you know, even now, the, you know, they're teaching children all the LGBTQ stuff. There are some people, even non-Muslims, who know that's wrong. Because they say, from their, their, their standpoint of morality, like, okay, if you're an adult, do whatever you want, right? Because they're, they believe in freedom of expression, whatever. But they say, keep the kids out of it. The non-Muslims are saying that now, right? They're saying, keep the kids out of this discussion because they don't need to be in it. So why are you throwing this down their throat, right? In schools, why are you, why are you doing this? So even they have that understanding that certain things are just right and wrong. They have that vague understanding because Allah put that inside of us. It's our moral compass, right? Um, so again, uh, we still mentioned the uh, co good company and bad company. So if you're in bad company, you start to think like those people. You start to act like them. You start to take their values. So now you might start to lose your natural hayat. Your fitrah gets corrupted, right? So, but when you're in good company, then your fitrah continues to guide you. But your, your, your compass inside that Allah placed, it cannot guide you. Your heart cannot guide you if it's not pure. Right? And that's why you have to surround yourself with good company because they will remind you. When you forget, they will be like, hey, I don't think this is right. You know, you never used to be like this or whatever, whatever the thing is. Right? And the second one is the learned hayat. This is something that we learn from other people. People teach it to us. Right? There's a natural hayat and then there's a learned hayat. So like social decorum, like, okay, if you go to somebody's house, how should you be? Like manners and stuff, right? Um, if you like, for example, started eating without somebody telling you to, right? Like the host is still setting the table and you're just like, you know, whatever, start eating. Not having any manners, right? That would be like a lack of hayat, right? Not, not hayat in the religious sense, but hayat in like the social sense, the, um, the relationships that we have with people. And so we have to, there are certain things that we learn about hayat, right? Okay, so the hijab thing gets sticky, right? Because every time, every time the topic of hayat is taught, hijab comes up. But it's really interesting because I had a very interesting discussion today with Imam Farhan about this. And hijab is not necessarily a sign of hayat. Which one? That one? Um, hijab is not necessarily a sign of hayat, but it can be. And the reason I say that, the, the most simple, yeah, the most simple answer is that when hijab was made fard, it was only made fard upon the free Muslim women, not the slave girls. The slave girls who were Muslim, because slavery was still allowed back then. Before this was before slavery became haram. So when Allah said in the Quran that they should wear hijab so they may be recognized. Right? The recognition referred to their free or slave status. Yes? So, Hashir Sa'ad Layyazain, that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Because there were the uh, white shirts that prophets Muhammad alayhi salam. So at that time when it was uh, prophet, it was only for the region to be hurt. Mm -hmm. Before it was lighter. It was for their protection, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it was for their protection. But the thing is, when it was, when it was made fard, it was only made fard on the free Muslim women. So then if we ask that, if we say that, okay, if, if you, you can only have haya, only if you wear hijab, right? If we say that, then we're actually excluding the, the slave women. Can the slave women who are not wearing hijab, can they not have haya? Is it possible? Like, then we're just, ex we're saying, like, by that logic, right? If, I'm just taking us logically. If we say that wearing hijab is the only way you can have haya, and that if you don't wear hijab, you don't have haya, if I say that, then I'm excluding all the slave girls who might be pious, who might be praying, who might be obedient to Allah, and they're not committing sins, but hijab is not fard on them. Is it fair to say that they don't have haya? Why the hijab is not fard today? Well, she said, she explained. <laughs> um, it's because like, uh, there was a fear that they might be harmed. So when Allah made hijab fard, he was saying that it's, it's, it's fard upon the free Muslim women. But now that, now that slavery doesn't exist anymore, like even in Islam, it doesn't exist anymore, um, hijab is fard upon everybody. So again, this, this discussion is not about what is hijab fard or not. That's not the discussion. I'm going to clarify. Um, hijab is fard, yes. And now it's fard upon everybody because we, we don't have the slave girls anymore. So hijab is fard upon everyone. And fard means by definition that if you don't wear hijab, you're punished, right? Of course, we don't go around telling people that if they don't wear hijab. But that's the ruling, right? The, the ruling of fard is that you must do it. And if you don't do it, you are punished. So that ruling still stands. But... You're accountable for it, yes. Like Allah, Allah can punish you for it. Just like when if you leave salah, of course salah is more, way more important than that. But we understand salah to be fard, right? We understand certain things that we have to do to be fard. So hijab is one of those things. Hijab is fard. And if we don't wear it, like it does, Allah can punish us, right? Because if you leave a fard action, Allah can punish you. But what I'm saying about haya is that we see this sometimes, right? Somebody is fully covered, mashallah. They might even be wearing proper hijab. But in their mannerisms, there is no haya. In their, um, the, 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 the things that they do, the places that they go, the people that they hang out with, there's no haya in it. They're comfortably sitting in places of sin. They're comfortably going out with people who you wouldn't want to be seen in public with. Right? Their, their, their friends are, you know, for example, like their friends are dating other people and they're doing all these haram things in public, Muslim or non Muslim. And this person who's a full hijabi is hanging out with them by choice and has no problem being in these places and with these people. That shows the lack of haya, right? I'm just talking real examples. And we also have people that we know who maybe don't wear hijab properly at all. Like maybe everything's showing. Or maybe they, they just don't wear hijab on their head, whatever. But the way they dress is still a little bit modest, right? But when you see their mannerisms, when you see the places they go to, the people they hang out with, they're more modest. They're, they have more hayat sometimes, right? I'm not saying this is the case everywhere, right? It's not necessary all the time, but it does happen, right? So when we, in our mind, if we see somebody with hijab, and we automatically assume this person has more haya, that's a problem. And we see somebody without hijab, and we automatically assume this person is, doesn't have haya, that's a problem, right? Because taqwa is in the heart. The Prophet ﷺ said taqwa ha huna, right? He said it three times when he pointed to his chest. He said taqwa ha huna, the heart, that taqwa is here. Yes. Yes, but I'm talking about also the understanding. Yes, we should not like, judge them by, by their, uh, whether they are wearing hijab yes. or not. Yes, yes. But for me, uh, mm -hmm. if uh, a woman is uh, wearing hijab, mm -hmm. I think um, she has haya from Allah. Yes, and that was the next point. Yeah. Yes, she has haya from Allah. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's doing uh, other things wrong. Yes. Yeah. Doesn't, make, um, doesn't do anything wrong. Yes. But I always, I always uh, hear this 
Yeah. I mean, they could be, right? I mean, we, we all are, right? Like, yeah. we, I mean, all of us, like, we're wearing hijab right now, but do we, do we not commit sins? We do, right? All of us. I, I know about myself, like, I'm not going to assume about you, but because we're all human, we can all quite easily say that we all commit sins and we all repent to Allah, may Allah forgive us. But what I'm saying is when we directly, like, automatically equate hayat with hijab only, that's kind of a problem because then we start like we start assuming that somebody doesn't have hayat that's that's all i'm saying yes yeah. this example always very they come with this example mm -hmm. uh, i don't like it because they encourage people especially women mm -hmm. to not wear hijab they say oh i'm wearing modern modestly i'm not doing anything wrong mm -hmm. why i should do what why i should wear mm -hmm. if you maybe if you uh the percentage of women who are wearing hijab and doing something wrong, you can maybe they will not exceed like thirty percent. Example should be so I don't, seventy percent, not only yeah. thirty percent. That's. I don't know if I, don't, I, I understand what you said, but I don't know where we can get these percentages from. And something else that's really I interesting is as I deal with um, younger people often. There's a lot more Muslim girls, young girls, who wear hijab, mashallah, but they don't even pray. There's a lot of them now. Whereas when I was growing up, we didn't have that. Like there's a lot of girls in college and high school because hijab is no longer like, it's not, it's not like a, it doesn't make you stand out anymore. There's hijabis everywhere. It's kind of cool to wear hijab now. You can style it, you can do whatever. It's, it's all over social media. Girls like to wear hijab now. They really enjoy it. And it makes them like, it makes them stand in, actually not stand out anymore. But increasingly, they're not praying. Yes. Um, if she doesn't pray, yeah. I think she's hurting herself. Hurting herself. Yeah. But someone who doesn't wear hijab is hurting the society. It's, I think the wrong is like bigger than someone who doesn't pray. Oh, I, I, don't, I disagree. Yes. Uh, because uh, prayer is way more important than... I know, I know, but because she's hurting herself. No, because at the end of the day, you want to hear what Allah says, right? Yeah, yes, it is about Allah at the end of the day, yes. Yeah, and Allah says, the, you know, the basic thing mm -hmm. to do is pray. Yes. But you don't hear any hadith or ayah mm -hmm. that says that um, hijab is something that is as important or more important than... Uh, yeah, that's why I specified that it is fard, but prayer is prayer is obviously up there. It's like the most important. I'm not I'm not saying hijab is not fard. I never said that. I'm saying that it is fard. But again, there's so much nuance. Like there's, I actually don't have time to get into um, what you said. But I'm just gonna end with this because um, I have a meeting right after this. So haya is in uh, haya in front of Allah. Again, this go all goes back to to Allah. And that is the most important level of hayat, right? And all the different definitions that we discussed, um, yes, there's other people involved. If you're advertising your sins to other people, you're impacting them, right? You're, you're inviting them to sin as well. Whereas if you're hiding your sins, um, you're, you're protecting people from your, from your harm, right? You're not normalizing sin. But publicizing sins is so bad because you're normalizing it. Um, whereas, but still, the most important aspect of haya is between you and Allah. And it does go back to obedience to Allah, right? The more you obey Allah, the more haya you have. It's actually that simple, right? And obe again, obedience takes different forms. The hijab is a form of obedience. Salah is a form of obedience. Having good character is a form of obedience, right? There's so many different forms of obedience. We have the, you know, the worship between us and Allah, and then we have the, the mu'amalat, right? We have the, our dealings with the people. All of it is ibadah. So the more that we are obedient to Allah in this area or that area, right, the more hayat we have, right? But there's some people who, there's some people who actually, um, they, they, they worry more about what other people think, even more than what they worry about Allah. And that's when it becomes a problem, right? So the question we should ask ourselves is, when I'm, when I'm praying, when I'm wearing my hijab, when I'm wearing whatever, when, when I'm deciding to do an act of worship, am I doing it? so that people will look at me a certain way, so that I will be perceived as more religious, or is it because 
I truly genuinely want to obey Allah and I want to add to that obedience, right? Like some people, first they wear only the hijab, then they add the abaya, then they add niqab, for example. Whatever you believe about it, right? It's because you want to add to your obedience to Allah. So you can take, that, that can take whatever forms, right? You pick acts of worship. After you do the fara'id, right, from the nafil acts, you can pick what you want to do. From the sunnah acts, you can pick what you want to do. As long as the fara'id are complete, right? Because the fara'id are the foundation. The fard actions are the foundation. So um, again, just last point, I, I, hijab is fard, definitely, but there's so much nuance. And I would definitely love to cover this again and continue this discussion because I didn't get to finish another point. Subhan rabbika rabbil izzati ma'isifun wa salamun ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Yeah.